Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for this day of being able to come into your house to praise and worship you, Lord, to glorify your name. God, we just pray, Lord, as we turn into your word, Lord, all the preparation, all the time spent means nothing if it's not you speaking. God, we just pray, Lord, that you can calm my heart, calm my mind, or allow me to let you flow through me. Lord, calm the hearts of all of us and allow us to seek out your advice for us. Lord, we just pray, Lord, that you will touch every heart in here today, Lord. Just use this time as a time for changing our lives to look more like you. God, we just love you and we pray to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Uh, children can be released for Children's Church if they didn't already go out there. Well, I was preparing for today, uh, the title is, When Compromise Exists, the Slow Fate Has Started. And most of us have a, pretty much all of us have a military background somewhere. And I was looking in Knowledge, the official safety magazine of the U.S. Army, and it stated in there, the leading cause of aviation and ground accidents continue to be over, overconfidence and complacency, often resulting in soldiers failing to execute operations using the task, conditions, and standards to which they were trained. Unsupervised, a soldier's desire to accomplish a mission can lead to taking shortcuts. Shortcuts in routine duties often lead to shortcuts in more compl complex tasks. And those shortcuts often lead to disaster. That magazine has a long list of such accidents in the US Army where the common thread was somewhere in the accident sequence someone knowingly violated a set standard. This was usually done with good intentions, often trying to make it easier to accomplish a mission. In many of those cases, leaders failed to take corrective action either before, during, or after the accident sequence. All of us can look at life, and we can look at our job, whether we're a doctor, a personnelist, a financial manager, a pilot, a mechanic, we can all look and say that there's no place in our line of work for shortcuts. We can all look and say that, that there's no place in life for that. But why is it so easy when we look at our Christian walk to allow shortcuts, to allow compromise to fade in? My first point is what is considered a compromise? What is? What are these shortcuts? What are these places where we allow the world to seek into our lives? As you look, advice we get, career, marriage, financial. The Bible says many places that we are supposed to seek God for our wisdom. We are supposed to seek out other godly people for our wisdom. We're supposed to look towards those who know him, elders in our church for our wisdom. But yet most of us, when it comes to our career, we look at those maybe higher ranking, maybe those who got there unselfishly. When it comes to our marriage, and our marriage might be on the rocks, we don't look to God for what might be causing that problem. We look towards Oprah or Dr. Phil. Not all of us, but some of us. When it comes to our financial advice, well, that Dave Ramsey guy, that's all he talks about is money. I don't want to listen to him. So we'll, we'll go out and we'll look at you know, getting a financial advisor and how should we manage our money instead of looking to the Bible and God, what are you calling me to do with my money? The second place is laws we don't follow. I'm guilty of this one. Most of these in here, I am guilty of. But speeding. How many people in here actually follow the Italian speed limit and go 60 kilometers an hour down AP Highway? That is the speed limit, right? 60 hours an hour, I think. 50. 50. Okay. So, yeah, even, even when I'm trying to be right, I'm still wrong. But is speeding really a sin? Romans 13, 1 through 2. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will, be, will bring judgment on themselves. Now, I'm not saying that it's a salvation issue if you speed or if you maybe cheat on your taxes a little bit. But it's a compromise that we allow in our life with God. The fourth one, and this one, um, 
liberties we try to justify, whether it be drinking, movies, or music. Most of us can all agree that we cannot find a verse in the Bible where it says having one beer is wrong. Most of us can agree that we enjoy having a beer with friends. I'm not saying that you should. I'm not saying that you should. Most of us can agree that going to a movie, I mean, Passion of the Christ was R-rated, right? Yeah, so, I mean, can we only allow ourselves to see R-rated Christian movies? I mean, I'm not saying that we need to be overly legalistic in what movies we are going to, but there are certain liberties that we take in our Christian faith that if Jesus was standing right next to us, we would not. In Galatians 5, 13 through 18, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use this liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware, lest you be consumed by one another. I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the lust of the flesh or for the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. So that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. So we can see in scripture there are many places where these common compromises are contradicted. These compromises that we allow in our lives, scripture preaches against it. So how can this lead to a slow faith? I mean, there's, there's certain things we probably wouldn't say that speeding is something that is going to cause us to get in a place where we're like, God, where are you? In Psalm 1.1, 1, 1, one of the main verses in forming this sermon, says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. If you see the natural downfall there, first, all we do is we get a little bit of advice from the ungodly. It seems normal. We're, we're looking at our career. We're trying to look out and better our family. So we're going any route we can to make sure that we are first. Once that seems normal to us, now we're standing in the way of sin. There's some differing opinions on what this verse means. If we're just standing there with the sinners and not walking away from them, or if now our lives are standing in the path of sinners trying to come to Jesus, they're looking at our lives and saying, well, I do that same thing. Man, this guy passed me on AP Highway, so I don't have to worry about my speeding. Man, this guy goes out with us every weekend. I don't have to worry about that. But when we're standing in the path of the sinners, it's not too far-fetched for us just to take a seat right in the seat of the scornful. Take a seat with those who are casting out insults towards other Christians. None of us would walk from the joy of our salvation. We can, we can, take, we can take a step back and remember when we first came a Christian. And we can look at the joy that we had flowing out from us. The excitement that there was in our walk with Christ. We were, everything there was about us just shined. God was so precious to us. And we were like, man, this is awesome. I never want to do anything to, to hurt, his, hurt his feelings. I want him to be so close to me all the time. We wouldn't go from the joy of our salvation to throwing insults at God. Satan knows we wouldn't do that. Ephesians 4.27 warns us against giving the devil a foothold. What is giving the devil a foothold? It's these small compromises. It's where we allow, okay, well, I start speeding today, and, okay, I don't need to stop at that stop sign. The cops are never there, so I can just go right through that. It's that small progression of things just getting worse. It's a small progression of us wanting to take more. The devil's a tricky guy. The devil is waiting. He's there ready to devour 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. I don't want this sermon to turn into something where there's a demon behind every bush. Because a lot of the times it's our own human flesh that puts us in that situation. But Satan is tricky. Satan's been doing this game way longer than we have. Satan was there to tempt Jesus when he was out in the wilderness. Satan is looking for ways for us to fall. 
In John 10.10, 10, it says Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He comes to steal our joy. He comes to steal our closeness with God. He comes to kill our ambitions. He comes to destroy anything that we can do or anything we can allow God to do through us. Satan comes to steal that. Anytime that Satan can take a Christian down, anytime Satan can take a Christian's witness away from him, he's sitting there waiting to do it. I mentioned even Jesus was tempted by Satan in Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness and to be tempted by the devil. That's the main reason he was going there. And he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Afterwards, he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones, become bread. But he, but he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hearts they shall bear you, they shall bear you up, lest you dash your hand against a stone. Then Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again the devil took him up on, on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Where do we get off thinking that Satan doesn't have these same temptations for us? We look at these temptations and we say, first, fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, I'd be hungry. You know, when I, when I have a PT test coming up and I sit there and go on some crazy freak diet and someone says, yeah, you can just have this bread. Oh, I'd love that bread. If I was tempted with that bread and knew it wouldn't impact me or my test, I would probably take that bread. If I was brought up and said, this, all this land, everything, your, your family's complete security is yours, wouldn't that be a hard thing to turn down? Most of these things that Satan tempted Jesus with in this time when he was in, up there meditating, fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, most of these things would be hard for us to let go. Are we going to put ourselves on the same ground as Jesus and say that we can win that battle in that time? Well, we do have the power of the Holy Spirit. So, yes, we can win that battle. But we also have the flesh, and the flesh is very evident within us. And we are way weaker than Jesus was. So how do we protect ourselves? We seek godly wisdom. First, I picked out Psalm 1.1, where... But in Psalm 1, 2, it answers that claim. It says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. So where do you get your wisdom? That was the first place in those verses. It said, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. So if that's our first place where we start to compromise a little bit, where do we get our counsel? Do we, do we go to God's word for the counsel? Do we spend the time in there that we're supposed to? Or do we use the excuse to leave our hard copy of the Bible under the bed because, well, it's a hard copy. It can't go with me everywhere. But I got the Bible on my cell phone, so I got this app. But then there's all these games on that, on that cell phone. So now I'd rather play games while, I'm, while I have this time on my own. So now we're not reading the Word as much. Now we've backed off. Now we're not getting that wisdom from God on a daily basis. Now maybe our wisdom is coming from what we watch other people do, other worldly examples. The second one is answer the call to holiness. How can we protect ourselves? We can. In 1 Peter 1.16, Peter quoted God telling the Israelites to be holy because I am holy. That's a tall claim. That's a tall order for us, to be holy as God is holy. But it's what we're called to do. Can we do it on our own? Absolutely not. But from our knees, we can. The third one is resist Satan, run to Jesus, or repent, and embrace humility. 
where I want to spend the rest of the time is in 1 Peter 5, 5 through 11. Sorry, this one, oh, it is up there, cool. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you, be submissive to one another, and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your, bro by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So we look at that. What's the first thing we are told to do in there is to resist Satan. Is when that temptation comes up, when that first little compromise comes into our life, when it's, well, I can go out and go out with my friends this night because it's all right. Because I, I know I'm strong. I know I'm not going to mess up that bad. So we allow that compromise to start. And then once we've compromised there and went out with them one night, next weekend comes along and they're like, oh, so now you're going to make the stand. So now you're going to say you won't come out with me because I'm a Christian. So now you're going to say that you won't drink with me because you're a Christian. Where was that last weekend? So then we feel bad and we're like, okay, cool, I'll go. And it naturally just gets worse and worse and worse. We end up maybe three weeks down the road, maybe a month, maybe a year down the road, turning around and looking and saying, God, how far have I fallen? God, how far away are you? Resist that first compromise. Resist that first temptation. Run to Jesus and repent. When that compromise does come in, yes, we can argue if some of these compromises are a sin. Yes, we could have theological debates day and night about whether having that one beer is wrong or not. Whether does it glorify God or does it glorify your worldly standards? Does it does it help does it bring you to a place in your workout when you listen to secular music? Does it bring you to a place where maybe you can dig down a little deeper? Can't you rely on God for that? That movie that you're going to see, does it does it help you escape reality just a little bit and just focus more on the movie screen? When you're 100% honest with yourself, that fear that you're having, does it just help you kind of drop the cares from the week and bring you to a place where ah, things don't bother you as much anymore? Resist those temptations. Repent from them. Run to Jesus. And embrace humility. One of the hardest things in any of these tests is our pride. You can't tell me what to do. I, I can handle this one. I can handle a drink and not give in. I can handle listening to this or watching this. I can handle doing that. All those statements start with an I. All those statements start with what you can do or what you can't do. Maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just when I try to justify my life before God. I start off with I. That's usually where it is. I can do this. That pride that seeps up, that pride that takes us and captures all our thoughts, captures everything we are, the pride is the worst sin that there can be because we get so blinded to God, we get so blinded to where God wants to use us. You guys get a good break today. I'm already ready to close up. But as we, as we take the time to look at this, when we take the time to reflect on where may, maybe God is calling us, we look at that word of holiness. We look at that word of repent. We look at all these godly words. We look at all these you know, $10 church words. And what do they mean in our lives? Holiness. Could God go to work with you? Would God feel comfortable sitting next to you? I mean, if you sit in a cubicle, if you ride a car, if you are out on the flight line from the ranches, if you are inspecting someone, if you're, if you're flying a plane, 
would God feel comfortable <laughs> sitting there right next to you? In our personal life, after we put the kids down to bed, is that time for mom and dad TV? Is that time for shows that we won't let our kids watch? If we won't let our kids watch them, should we be watching them? If we're, if we're saying, I don't want your ears to hear that. Is God saying, I don't want your ears to hear that? Holiness. Where's the line? Do we spend more time trying to justify what we can get away with than we do saying, God, how can I live more for you? So that's holiness. Repent. When we, when we see those in our lives, when we, when we see where we have fallen short, do we run back to Jesus? Do we get down on our knees and say, God, I'm sorry? Do we look at the cross? Do we look at that and wonder, Jesus had to suffer on there? It, it used to be such a mystery to me how Jesus could have only spent that one day suffering, hanging on the cross, and then three days paying for all of our sins. Jesus Christ lives in infinity. Jesus Christ doesn't know time. God doesn't know time. So yes, he paid for every single one of our sins. So when we sit there and we finally come to a point in our lives and we see that that small compromise is sin, and then we look to the cross and we know that Jesus had to pay that price. When Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It wasn't, it wasn't the lashings on his back. It was that eternal separation. It was that God the Father had to look at his son for every time you commit sin, X, Y, and Z, and he had to see his son commit. So when we say, I may be strong enough to deal with this, yes, I know it might be a sin, and yes, God's trying to tell me to stop. Shouldn't we stop now so God doesn't have to see his son that one more time of going to that R-rated movie? Uh, we may think it's only an innocent two-hour movie, but God is perfect. God is holy. That two-hour movie deserves help. If we come to a place where we say that is sin, that sin cannot enter heaven. So we repent from it. We run to Jesus. And we embrace the humility. As you've heard today's sermon, as you've listened to this, there may be some of you out there who maybe all this seems a little foreign. Maybe all this seems like, well, this doesn't matter to me. Who's this Jesus that you're talking about? Jesus is the one who died on the cross for our sins. He is the one that we have to run to. He is the only one where our salvation is. If you want to know any more about being a Christian, about being saved, uh, when, you, when the worship team comes up here, there will be people up here to talk to you about it. There will be people up here to tell you about Jesus, to tell you about how to be saved, but you've got to count the cost as well. You've got to look at it, and God's going to call for your life to be a little bit different. God's going to call you to change some things. But it's not that we he's going to tell us to get rid of all the things that we like. It's that when I first started talking about the joy of your salvation, that joy is going to be so much better than some of the fun that we were maybe having before. If you... Yes, this church is going through some changes. Pastor right now is gone in the States. Yes, we're going through a pastor search committee. Yes, we're looking at maybe having a new building. But this isn't my church. This isn't Pastor Sam's church. This isn't anyone in particular's church. This is God's church. It's been around for quite some time, and it's going to be around as long as he wants it to. So if you're looking at this church and wondering how you can help out, wondering where you can step up and serve, wondering where 